Uh, my name is Jay Shamba. I'm the co-director of the Institute for International Economic Policy, or IIEP, here at George Washington University. Um, we at IIEP are very pleased to be hosting this event on rethinking financial regulation for the 21st century, along with our co-hosts, the GW Law School's Business and Finance Law Program. Um, IAP is located at the Elliott School at GW, and it is a cross-school interdisciplinary research center at GW. Uh, we aim to serve as a catalyst for high-quality, multidisciplinary research um, and nonpartisan research on policy issues surrounding economic globalization. And so we interpret that mandate pretty broadly um, and think uh, we do a lot of work on trade, international finance, development economics, to poverty studies, to climate change, to economic policy more broadly. And we have long focused on questions surrounding global economic governance, something which financial regulation is clearly an important part of. IEP has been quite active uh, during the pandemic um, and hosting a number of series virtually on inequality, on China, on India, and on rethinking capitalism and democracy. Um, please take a look at our website to see details of upcoming events. Um, financial regulation, uh, it seems, is something that uh, often needs to be rethought on something of a serial basis as finance itself evolves and as the players in the financial system find ways to adjust to or in some cases uh, adjust around the rules they face. And so I'm actually quite excited to hear uh, today's discussion on this topic. So without further ado, um, welcome virtually to Washington, D.C., to GW and now I'll turn it over to Jeremy Pam, director of the uh, business and finance law program at GW's law school. Good day, uh, I'm Jeremy Pam, uh, director of the business and finance law program at GW law school. Um, I'm delighted to join with Jay and our uh, friends and colleagues at uh, the IIEP and the Elliott school in uh, co-hosting this exciting event with one of our most illustrious uh, members of the GW Law faculty, Art Wilmart. Let me say just uh, a word, uh, a couple of words about GW Law's business and finance law program. Uh, GW Law has a long tradition of education and business and finance law, and this tradition is alive and well today in the intelligence and promise of our JD and LLM students, in the intelligence, in the accomplishments of our alums in Washington, New York, and around the world, in the broad and deep expertise of our faculty, such as art and the range of our course offerings and in events featuring speakers like uh, those today. In addition to the many other elements of business and finance, legal practice in the modern world, we in the business and finance law program like to highlight uh, three overarching themes, uh, global finance uh, and stability, innovation and entrepreneurship uh, to better advise uh, innovative business clients to, and to innovate in one's own practice of law and in life generally. And third and finally, what we call business leadership and judgment. With that, let me turn it over to my friend and colleague, Sunil Sharma. Uh, thank you, Jay and Jeremy. Um, um, let me say that we are, this is the fifth seminar in the series on finance for sustainability to taking stock of climate change and how humanity may be altering it. Today's seminar focuses on rethinking financial regulation for the 21st century. Finance affects all aspects of our lives, from the functioning of the economic system to social cohesion to the environment that we depend on for our survival. Hence the structure of the financial system, its governance and its operations are fundamental to uh, sustainable prosperity. The financial crisis of 2007 and the pandemic crisis of 2020 showed that global financial markets can be dangerously unstable. Governments and central banks rescued financial markets in 2008 and in 2020 with enormous bailouts and unconventional monetary policies. Several issues are also being raised with large technology companies seeking to enter the banking business. This development could transform the banking industry and if the transition is not handled well, extend government bailouts to an even larger section of our commercial economy. The seminar will discuss regulatory policies that would reshape our current financial system to make it more stable and far less dependent on government bailouts. To provide context, um, you know, I, I used to give a, a lecture a long, long time ago in Singapore on issues raised by the global financial crisis. And what I'm going to try and do is by listing the set of issues that we used to discuss, um, I'm going to show 
how complex the system is and how complex the issues have become. Um, and the discussion that we're going to have today with, 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 with Art Wilmarth and Eric Gerding um, are in, in, in many ways central to trying to reshape um, the financial system. So let's hear. I'm just going to list the issues. Issues. Regulation of banks. So there we had off-balance sheet activities, capital adequacy, liquidity, leverage, risk management and stress testing, living wills, Volcker, Vickers, Likonen, um, in terms of structural issues. Second, we had regulation of shadow banking and related markets and institutions. Securitization and structured finance, conduits, special investment vehicles, broker dealers, investment banks, money market, mutual funds, finance companies, the re functioning of the repo market, collateral availability, management and reuse. Three, regulation of capital and derivative markets. Short selling, transparency of OTC derivative markets, uh, CCPs and centralized clearing, credit insurance, monolines. Four, credit ratings and credit ratings and rating agencies. Five, central banking issues, lender of last resort facilities, maker, market maker of last resort, exit strategies from unconventional policies, role in promoting um, employment and economic growth. Six, deposit insurance. Seven, troubled, supporting troubled banks and non-bank financial intermediaries. Eight, insolvency regimes for banks and non-bank financial intermediaries. Uh, issues of prompt and corrective action, too big to fail, cross-border concerns. Ten, uh, nine, govern uh, consumer protection. Ten, governance and compensation structures in financial institutions. Eleven, accounting standards, including fair value accounting. 12, macroprudential regulation, pro-cyclicality, interconnectedness, common exposures, fire sales of assets, bank, non-bank nexus, systemic risk assessment, systemic risk surcharges, calibrating policies and implementation. 13, the institutional design of regulatory uh, 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 structures. 14, international regulatory coordination. 15, fiscal policies and sovereign debt management. Implicit and explicit, implicit and explicit government guarantees to the financial system, long-term sustainability of government finances. Now that's a, a very quick listing of the sort of gamut of issues that we had to deal with, or at least think through post 2007. The complexity of the system, the complexity of our regulations, I think um, should give us pause. And that I think we need to be thinking about structural changes that could both simplify the system and make it more stable. So today it is really an honor to have Professor Art Wilmarth as a speaker. I was fortunate to meet Art and Jeremy in my first month at the Elliott School in 2018. And over the years, I've participated and attended many events organized by the Business and Finance Law Program and met many distinguished guests. Um, Tom Honig, Lee Bukai, Paul Tucker come to mind. <laughs> I'm convinced that financial policy making would benefit considerably if we could bring together practitioners and faculty in business, law, economics, politics, international affairs. Um, and now with FinTech posed to possibly restructure finance, mathematics, statistics, data sciences, computer science, and engineering. Professor Wilmarth is Professor Emeritus of Law at George Washington University Law School in Washington, DC. He is considered the doyen of financial law professors in the Washington, DC area, and as one person said to me, He's probably forgotten more financial law than most of us will learn in a lifetime. So it's a great privilege to have him here. Art joined GW Law's faculty in 86 after private practice, including as a partner in Jones Day Washington office. During his over 30 years on the faculty, he has taught courses in banking law, contracts, corporations, professional responsibility, and American constitutional history. He served as the executive director of GW Law's Center for Law, economics and finance from 2011 to 2014. You may have seen his recent book, which was published by Oxford University Press, Taming the Mega Banks, Why We Need a New Glass-Steagall Act. And he was also the co-editor of The Panic of 2008, Conse Causes, Consequences and Implications for Reform, which was published in 2010. He's published widely on legal issues. And in 2005, the American College of Consumer Financial Services Lawyers awarded him its prize for the best law review article published in the field of consumer financial services law during the previous year. Art has testified before committees of the US Congress and the California legislature on financial regulatory issues. 
In 2010, he was a consultant to the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, the body established by Congress to report on the causes of the financial crisis of 2007 to 2009. We also have an illustrious discussant who has written deeply on the issues we will discuss today. Eric Gerding is a professor at the University of Colorado Law School. His research interests include securities, banking law, the regulation of financial markets, products and institutions, payment systems, and corporate governance. His research also focuses on the application of technology to financial regulation, including analyzing the use of technologies in governing financial markets. Eric's book, Law, Bubbles, and Financial Regulation, that was published in 2014, examines the interaction of asset price bubbles and financial regulation. Prior to joining academia, Eric practiced law in the New York and Washington DC offices of the firm Cleary Gottlieb Steen & Hamilton. His practice at the firm included representing clients in the financial services and technology industries in an area of financial transactions and regulatory matters. With that, um, I am um, happy uh, to cede the floor to uh, Professor Wilmoth. Art. Sunil, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And I would like to also thank uh, Jay and Jeremy, uh, the Elliott School and, and the Law School uh, for sponsoring this uh, very important discussion. Uh, to, to frame my comments, I, I wanna pick up on, on some things that Sunil said about the set of issues that uh, really confront uh, global financial regulators after the financial of 2007 through nine uh, and unfortunately have been made salient once again uh, by the pandemic crisis of, of 2020, uh, which continues. Uh, and I think that the, the one way to think about it is, you know, what, what, what do banks do? What makes them special? And I, here I, I shamelessly copy uh, a, a speech and paper that Eugene Corrigan uh, gave back in 1982 and, and uh, updated a couple of times since then. He said that banks were special for three major reasons, and I agree with him. One, uh, they are the repository of deposits, particularly for households, but also for uh, the commercial sector, uh, and that the, uh, the, the importance of, of maintaining the safety of deposits is obviously a very, a very key aspect. Secondly, um, they are the infrastructure for the payment system. Uh, they, they provide reliable uh, and hopefully uh, increasingly uh, speedy uh, transmission of funds uh, from person to person and around the world. Third, they are a transmission belt for monetary policy. So the central banks essentially have to implement their monetary policy primarily by working through banks. Um, even as he wrote these remarks and, and gave them in 1982, um, the specialness of banks was being broken down and being impaired. And we'll talk about how that happened. Um, I think we need to go back to Corrigan's vision uh, of banks as a special type of infrastructure that should be kept carefully separate and separated from both the capital markets and the general economy, the commercial economy. Unfortunately, as I will discuss, um, we took down the barriers between uh, banks in the capital markets. And as my recent book argues, I believe that was an important cause of the global financial crisis of 2007-09 uh, and has continued to be a cause of continued instability as shown in the events of the past year. Uh, unfortunately, we are also now uh, in the process of undoing, uh, removing the separation between banks and the commercial economy. Uh, and this is particularly shown by the uh, invasion or incursion of so-called FinTech companies, high technology companies into the banking business. Uh, and in my view, this will further impair uh, the reliability of banks uh, as infrastructure, uh, their objectivity and their impartiality and their dedication to pro providing infrastructure uh, functions and uh, will simply uh, magnify the problems we've seen uh, by allowing banks to combine with capital markets activities. So uh, with, without further ado, uh, I'm going to pull up uh, some slides um, and uh, we will proceed. In my view, banks entered the capital markets twice during the past century, the 1920s and then after the uh, 
late 1990s. Uh, this is particularly true in the United States, but a similar uh, process was going on in Europe and in, in the UK uh, beginning in the late 80s and early 90s. So the, the 90s was a time of a rebirth of universal banking on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, as we had seen in the 1920s. Uh, with the important uh, exception of countries like Canada and Britain in the 1920s. But uh, Europe had universal banking structures, uh, but the most important was in the United States as banks entered the, the securities markets. Uh, so we had two, two instances of banks entering the securities markets and, and then two uh, boom and bust cycles promptly followed. There was a great boom and bust cycle uh, of the roaring 20s, which led to the crash of 1929 and the Great Depression of 1929 to 33, uh, which spread across the Atlantic uh, and engulfed uh, all of Europe, essentially. Um, interestingly, as we can discuss, uh, the UK uh, certainly uh, experienced some downturn, uh, but nothing like a Great Depression. Uh, and, and, and as I point out in my book, their banks were not combined with the securities markets. And I believe that was an important reason why the UK did not have a, a collapse similar to the US or uh, continental Europe uh, in, in the Great Depression. Uh, now, the, the, in response to the Great Depression, Congress passed the Glass-Steagall Act of 1929 to 33, uh, sorry, uh, Glass-Steagall Act of 1933. The Glass-Steagall Act uh, had several important provisions. One was to create a system of federal deposit insurance uh, to provide for safety of deposits in banks. Uh, the uh, second was to separate banks from the capital markets. Banks were, were prohibited from engaging in underwriting of securities or trading in securities, except for government bonds. Uh, it was understood that banks would need to continue to be involved in the government bond market because uh, uh, the government really relies on banks to be uh, distributors uh, and dealers in government bonds, but, but no other type of securities uh, would be allowed to, for banks. Uh, conversely, non-banks were prohibited from uh, accepting deposits. Uh, the term deposits was not carefully defined, unfortunately, but was understood to be uh, short-term financial claims that were payable at par, 100% of face value, uh, on demand or at a very short term on a very short-term basis. Uh, this created a very uh, strong wall between banks and the securities markets. Um, and then a, a follow-up statute called the Bank Holding Company Act, which we'll uh, discuss later, reinforced the separation and also separated uh, banks and securities markets uh, from insurance companies. So we had three separate and independent sectors uh, in the financial markets of the United States after uh, the 1930s uh, and th between the 1930s and the 1990s, uh, banks were separate from securities markets, banks were separate from insurance companies. Uh, and this system was remarkably stable uh, through the late 1980s. Uh, now, beginning in, in, the, in, the, in the mid to late 1980s, uh, with plenty of lobbying uh, and pushing by large banks, uh, regulators, bank regulators began to open loopholes, uh, which undermined the integrity of the Glass-Steagall Act. Uh, but uh, the, the Glass-Steagall Act was not fully removed until the Glass I'm sorry, the graham leach Bliley Act of 1999. Uh, but it was a progressive sort of uh, undermining and tearing down, uh, which continued for over a decade until the repeal happened. Uh, now, until that happened, one reason that, that the system was stable was that financial uh, disruptions did not spread across the financial markets. They were confined within individual sectors. And a, remark a notable example of that was 1987, when the um, stock market crashed. And the stock market crash obviously placed great strain on securities, broker-dealers, and other securities companies but did not impair banks because banks weren't significantly exposed to securities. And in fact, the Fed mobilized banks uh, through the discount window to provide loans to securities broker dealers to prevent their failure. So the, the, the regulators could call on the banking industry to help support the securities industry. When 
when the when this uh, when Glass Steagall was removed and these uh, these you could say hermetically uh, sealed barriers were were torn down uh, when the financial crisis of 2007 came along. Uh, as soon as the securities firms were in trouble, uh, the banks were almost immediately in trouble because they were heavily exposed to the same risks as the securities broker dealers, uh, and neither side could help the other. And so the only re possible response was for massive government bailouts. Uh, now, as, as we now move on to the slide that, that was, it was my second slide, um, the, I believe that universal banks, universal banks are banks that have securities powers. Uh, they can create a, can conduct a universal type of financial business. They create dangerous boom and bust cycles for five reasons. One is, of course, they can use low cost government insured deposits to fund risky loans. Uh, of course, all banks can do that. Uh, but but we, we shouldn't lose sight of the incredibly low cost funding provided by government insured deposits. Uh, B becomes critical here. Uh, normal banks uh, that don't have capital markets activities uh, essentially have to maintain loans on their balance sheets, uh, and, and they have to be concerned about the long-term performance of those loans, or they have to sell those loans to someone else, uh, probably with some type of recourse, uh, and, and, and so they, the loans could come back to them if, if they're bad loans. But through securitization, once you repeal Glass-Steagall uh, and, and, re and remove the, the prohibition on securitization, now banks can move risky loans off their balance sheet, package them up into, into asset-backed uh, securities, and sell them as purportedly safe investments to investors who probably, and in many cases, absolutely did not know the underlying risks uh, of, of the loans. Uh, that were now being packaged into securities that were being uh, uh, sold to them, often with AAA ratings from credit ratings agencies that were paid handsome fees uh, to get those ratings. Um, and so banks now have the illusion that, oh, we can get, we can move these loans off our balance sheets. We won't be exposed to them. And, and so what we want to do is create as many of these uh, securities and as many of these security sales as possible. So now you have instead of a long-term monitoring uh, of loans, you now have uh, short-term deals, uh, one deal after the other, uh, which creates a bonus-driven culture, as pointed out in 5D, with upfront fees and short-term profits, which encourage banks to forget about longer-term risks. And then when you combine deposit-taking, lending, securities underwriting, and trading, you now have manifold conflicts of interest, uh, which uh, prevent universal banks from acting either as objective lenders or as impartial providers of investment advice. Uh, they are just driven to sell, 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 uh, to get the fees as quickly as they can. Uh, and, and, and of course, uh, lending becomes reckless uh, under these circumstances. And then lastly, of course, universal banks are giant financial conglomerates. Uh, they're too big to fail manage or regulate effectively, and they're largely insulated from market discipline. Um, okay, the, the, this slide shows uh, if in the bottom panel the two great credit booms that I discussed. So you see on the left-hand side the end of the credit boom of the 1920s, uh, which collapses uh, after the, the, the Great Depression begins, uh, spirals down, you know, through World War II, and then um, uh, U.S. debt, this is private sector debt, doesn't include government debt. Private sector debt begins to grow uh, slowly uh, through the 50s and 60s and 70s, and then begins to accelerate in 1987 uh, as Glass-Steagall is progressively undone and unwound. And you can see how private sector debt uh, skyrockets upwards uh, after 1987, uh, particularly in the household sector and the financial sector. Uh, households taking on all sorts of mortgage uh, debt, uh, financial uh, sector taking on all sorts of speculative bets. Um, and uh, the, the, where the peak had been 250% of GDP at, at, just after 1929, uh, by the time you get to two, 2007, it's 288% of GDP. If you move up to the top panel, this is how UK private sector debt uh, grew after 1987. 
that's a key date because uh, the Big Bang occurred in, in, in the UK in 1986, which for the first time allowed commercial banks to, to buy uh, securities, brokers, and dealers and to become universal banks. Uh, and the skyrocketing that occurred in, in, in the UK is even more spectacular. Uh, from from a, a private sector debt that was about 70% of GDP in 1987, it, it rockets upwards to over 400% by the time you get to 2007, just 20 years. And so the financial sector in the United, United Kingdom was even more uh, over leveraged and more vulnerable uh, and, and more doomed to fail when the financial crisis of 2007 started. Uh, and in fact, the, the British government had to bail out four of their nine largest banks. Uh, and and the, the, another one called Barclays uh, sur survived without a bailout by the skin of its teeth and apparently some fraud, if you believe recent litigation. Um, so uh, you, you see how universal banking is, I, th I think, uh, inextricably linked to, to credit booms. Um, we talked about the bonus-driven culture. Uh, this chart, uh, which comes from Philippon and Reshef, a, a very well-known article in 2012, traces how deregulated financial markets are linked to extraordinary compensation. Uh, the dots uh, show how people in finance are paid relative to people in non-financial business sectors. You see that in, from 1910 to 1930, uh, the finance sector received very high compensation, particularly at the end of the boom of the Roaring Twenties, uh, because of universal banking activities, securities, uh, underwriting, speculation, uh, all sorts of deals uh, that are described in my book, uh, in the first half of the book. And then after Glass-Steagall was passed, look what happened. Uh, Compensation in the financial sector plummeted as banks were, were required to act as traditional financial intermediaries and as infrastructure providers. Uh, and uh, as you as you get to the 1950s through the 1970s, basically uh, people working in the finance sector are paid just about the same as people working in other uh, uh, non-financial business sectors. And then look what happens uh, as Glass-Steagall has begun to be first undermined and then repealed, particularly after 1990, when things get pretty serious with the undermining, uh, the, the, the financial compensation rockets upward. And by the time you get to 2008, um, it's even higher than it was in the 1920s relative to other business sectors. 1.75 times, almost double uh, what, what other sectors were, were paying their workers. Another interesting data point is that in 1980, which is before the deregulation started, uh, senior financial regulator, I'm sorry, senior uh, financial executives uh, at the top of, of financial institutions were paid about 10 times what senior financial regulators were paid. By the time you get to 19, I'm sorry, by the time you get to 2005, they were paid 60 times what senior financial regulators were paid. And then the revolving door starts spinning as regulators begin to see uh, very, very lucrative uh, opportunities uh, in moving to the private sector. And in my view, the revolving door, if, if you think you're gonna go through the revolving door after you leave uh, uh, your role as a financial regulator, I think it's going to have a significant impact on how you regulate. Are you gonna be, um, are you, going, are you going to be a super tough regulator uh, and still expect to get that lucrative private sector employment? Uh, I think that's at least uh, questionable. Um, okay, so Congress passes the Dodd-Frank Act, uh, which many of you know about after the Great Recession uh, in 2010. Uh, Dodd-Frank adopted highly technical reforms, uh, many of which uh, uh, Sunil has referred to, stronger capital, stronger liquidity, a new framework for resolving failures of so-called uh, SIFIs, uh, systemically important financial institutions, a lot, all very technical stuff, but it didn't change the basic structure of our financial system. It left in place the same dangerously unstable system dominated by universal banks and large shadow banks like private equity firms and hedge funds that aren't regulated like banks, but provide many of the same similar services, uh, such as deposits, payments, services, and loans. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, 
but uh, also the, 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 the post-crisis reforms created what I call a global doom loop because governments and central banks keep providing too big to fail guarantees to universal banks and large shadow banks, and they intervene whenever necessary to stabilize the financial markets. Uh, as they did obviously in 2008 and nine, as they did when the repo market froze up in September of 2019 and more massively in March, 2020, when the entire financial markets froze up, of course they rushed in and bailed everybody out. Um, now this of course results in a continually rising level of private sector and public sector debt because universal banks and large shadow banks keep providing this debt and earning the fees from doing so. And of course, it's supported by uh, unconventional and very accommodating monetary policies of central banks. And investors and creditors keep taking more risk because they expect that governments and central banks will rush in to protect uh, SIFIs and backstop financial markets and prevent major disruptions. And so we have this absolute escalation of global debt during this period when universal banks and shadow banks are roaring along. Um, 84 trillion in 2000, 167 trillion in 2007, 257 trillion in 2019, and 24 trillion of extra debt just last year. Um, so if we look at the next slide, this shows the rocketing upward of global debt as a share of GDP. Uh, this takes you to 2017 when it was about just under 325 uh, percent, as, as shown in the prior slide, it's now up to 380 percent between 2017 and 20. And the question has to be, how, how long can this go on? I mean, how long can debt be piled up on top of itself? Uh, how long before either inflation takes off or sovereign defaults occur or widespread uh, corporate and household debts uh, are, begin to default? Uh, how long can the how, how many fingers does the Dutch boy have? How many how many cracks in the dike can he plug up before the dike simply blows open? Uh, I think we're 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 testing <laughs> all of those questions. Um, okay, uh, we can talk a little bit more of this in Q and A. But the, the Glass Steagall Act, a new Glass Steagall Act, which is what I propose would take us back to the wisdom of 1933, that banks should be separate from the capital markets and non-banks should not be engaged in banking activities. So uh, short-term deposit substitutes like money market, mutual funds, repo agreements uh, would, would not be permitted outside banks. Uh, only banks could issue uh, short-term financial instruments payable at par on, de on demand or within 90 days. Uh, uh, anybody else would have to fund themselves with medium term and longer term debt. And I think the shadow banking system would shrink significantly. There really was no shadow banking system uh, of any size before about 1980. Uh, it, it was when money market mutual funds were allowed to exist and repo agreements were given bankruptcy uh, protections uh, that, the, that the shadow banking market took off. Um, and we can talk about the advantages of the Glass-Steagall Act, but a major one is that uh, it would reestablish these risk separations, risk buffers, preventing financial contagion, and it would also prevent this unhealthy influence that universal banks uh, have over our system, uh, where I believe our system is, is really being held hostage in many ways to the survival of universal banks and large shadow banks. Uh, they are no longer the servants of commerce, industry, and society. They are the masters. Uh, we should reverse that. Um, okay, uh, we talked about FinTech and the separation of banking and commerce. So the FDIC and the OCC have been inviting technology companies to come into the US banking industry uh, by allowing acquisitions of FDIC, FDIC insured industrial banks, which have a special loophole in the Bank Holding Company Act, uh, which was never intended uh, to break down the separation of banking and commerce, but being used for that purpose. And the OCC is trying to charter new types of uninsured national banks uh, that could be acquired by technology companies. Uh, the whole purpose of both of these types of acquisitions is to allow technology firms to own banks and not have to comply with the Bank Holding Company Act, because the Bank Holding Company Act prohibits any commercial firm 
from owning banks. It also prohibits banks from owning any commercial firm. And moreover, it gives the Fed consolidated supervisory authority uh, over uh, all companies that control banks and the affiliates of those companies. Um, now, again, we have the same problem here that if you allow commercial firms to acquire and own banks, banks are no longer going to act as impartial lenders. They have powerful incentives to make loans to their owners or their owners' customers, especially under conditions of financial stress. Uh, and it also creates the very strong likelihood that the federal safety net, including deposit insurance, including the Fed's lender of last resort authority, including the Fed's guarantee for payment systems, including too big to fail bailouts are gonna be provided to large commercial owners of banks. And we saw that with GE, General Motors and GMAC, GMAC during 2008-09 because they, they were essentially owning industrial banks uh, in the banking system and, and the, Fed the Fed and the federal government and the FDIC had to bail them out uh, to keep them uh, from collapsing. Um, I make the argument that the repeal of Glass-Steagall bankified, a, a term I like to use, bankified our capital markets by essentially wrapping them together with banks and extending the federal safety net to protect those markets. So they're no longer markets. They're now bankified, uh, subsidized markets. And if we allow technology firms into the banking industry, that's going to threaten to bankify our entire economy. And where will market discipline be at, at that point? We could talk a little bit about uh, uh, Wirecard and Greensill. These are two scandals that people ought to be paying a lot of attention to because they show the risks of allowing commercial firms to control banks. And especially they show the, the, the dangers of not having consolidated supervision over all parent companies and all affiliates of banks. So uh, the German regulator Baffin, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, had uh, supervision over only Wirecard Bank and only Green Cell Bank, had no supervision over their affiliates, uh, their, their parent companies, and they, the Baffin simply didn't know and didn't detect uh, evidence of fraud and reckless lending involving both banks. Uh, and regulators in other countries, including the UK and Australia, also didn't see it, uh, didn't pay attention to it. Uh, these are these are warning signs that tell us what's going to happen if we break down the barriers between banking and commerce. And then uh, I think what's going on in China, the struggle between Chinese authorities and Ant Group and Tencent, uh, also show first how quickly uh, technology firms can become major players in the, in the financial system, the banking system, if they're allowed to do so. But the problems they create, uh, both companies have been accused of funneling bad loans to partner banks and engaging in anti-competitive conduct by obstructing customers of their platform from using other platforms or, or using uh, other uh, uh, firms that are affiliated with their competitors uh, again, why should we want these kind of, of problems uh, to occur in our system? Um, so again, I go back to my, my earlier comment, which is we need strong structural barriers that would simplify the regulatory problems we confront. Uh, one of those strong structural barriers would be to reestablish Glass-Steagall. Another strong structural barrier which we have and which we should not lose is the separation between banking and commerce. We must maintain that. Each one is essential. Uh, if we don't have both, uh, we're going to have the problems that have been uh, revealed by uh, recent crises. Um, thank you very much. I'll, I'll stop here. We'll, we'll spend the next uh, 25 minutes um, having um, Eric and Art um, have a back and forth on the issues, many issues that Art has raised. Uh, so Eric, the floor is yours. So thank you to everyone at GW for having uh, Art and, and me today. Um, and thank you, Art, for a wonderful book. Uh, everyone in the banking law uh, space is, uh, all of our, our scholars are basically working in your shadow. Um, uh, I'm a big fan of the book, uh, Art, but uh, let me play devil's advocate today um, just to make the... Uh, discussion more interesting and make your ideas a little bit more um, uh, pop out a little bit more. Um, 
One of the big arguments that you hear in, in favor of universal banks is that isn't uh, uh, a pretty strong argument in having universal banks. If you look at um, Canada and Australia, isn't that an example of how universal banking um, can and should work? Uh, yeah, so I think um, let's put Canada and Australia aside just for a minute. Um, I think that the the, history, the the record of universal banking to me uh, has has been very poor. I think that they prosper during good times, and I think in many ways it's a procyclical um, type of enterprise because, as I said, they they have such strong incentives to pile up deal upon deal upon deal and to produce loans for securitization, uh, to produce securities for trading purposes, uh, and so essentially deals are created uh, for their own sake uh, without often looking at the fundamental value of what each deal represents. Um, so I think that they're a very pro-cyclical organization. And my view is uh, the theoretically diversification seems uh, attractive, but they, they failed the asset test twice because universal banks, in my view, failed on both sides of the Atlantic in the, in the 1930s. Uh, as I argue in the first half of my book, and then they failed on the both sides of the Atlantic in, in the 2007-09 period, uh, as argued in the second half of my book. And in 2020, they didn't provide any stability or resilience. In other words, as soon as the pandemic crisis broke out, every financial market we know of froze up, including the corporate bond market, and they weren't able to uh, sustain any of those markets and central banks and governments had to rush in and bail out everybody. So my view is if they're so wonderful, why didn't they stand up uh, to any of these crises of the 1930s of 2007-09 or of 2020? Their, rec their actual empirical record is terrible. Um, now, why do I think that's true? I think, I think conflicts of conflicts of interest, I think, uh, and, and, and the too big to fail moral hazard problem, I think overwhelms any possible arguments about diversification. And they actually operate these enterprises in a very unitary way. They don't operate them uh, in sort of segmented, uh, walled off, uh, uh, separate, you know, decision making bodies. Uh, you know, in many of the scandals, uh, when they question bankers, well, you know, if they work for Citigroup, well, what, what subsidiary Citigroup did you work for? I don't know. I worked for Citigroup. I mean, uh, and and they would have things like Citigroup Corporate and Investment Bank, which shows that the bank and the capital markets activities were all mixed together. So, I think that the diversification to me is a theoretical argument that's never been proved and practiced under crisis conditions. Uh, the, one other thing I would say is. I think it's a too big to manage problem. In other words, I don't think uh, individual groups of people can manage these sprawling multi-trillion dollar organizations. Now, Canada and Australia, interesting as you point out, two things can be said about both countries. They are very uncompetitive. They both have a small number of very large banks with universal banking powers. If you talk to people in Australia or they talk to people in Canada, many of them view uh, their banking systems as oligopolistic and, and, and uncompetitive. So they're not subject to much competition. And the Australian system was sort of undressed and exposed by a recent uh, royal inquiry that showed massive conflicts of interest, self-dealing and abuses of customers. Um, one more thing I would say about both Australia and Canada, they benefited during the financial crisis in the succeeding period because they were selling something to China other than debt securities. They were selling massive commodities, especially Australia. So Australia had this enormous commodity boom and Canada had a pretty strong commodities boom because they were selling oil and minerals and, and coal and other things to, to China uh, and feeding China's boom. So I, I, my own view is I don't think you can separate the health of the the banking systems in in, uh, in Australia and Canada from their competitive, uh, you know, sort of superiority over everybody else in, in that country, and the fact that the economies of both country countries were booming uh, because of their links to China. So let me push 
bit about that on that part because the the relationship between competition and sort of the antitrust and consumer sense and stability is complicated um, to say the least, right? I mean, there yes. are some scholars who argue that less competition, right? Like having more uh, of an oligo oligopolistic industry might be better for financial stability. Do you agree with that or do you take issue? Uh, I, you know, I, I think that there's certainly a, such a thing as hyper competition, you know, too much competition. <laughs> certainly it would not make sense to have, uh, you could say, un, uh, you know, unprofitable, you know, unviable banks, you know, uh, being chartered that simply can't make a reasonable profit and can't succeed. So I, I agree that you, you know, that there's a point at which competition reaches a diminishing returns and becomes essentially uh, self-consuming. Um, oligopoly, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not a fan of oligopoly and I don't think I ever will be. I'm too much of a Brandeisian uh, uh, from, from my perspective. But I, I realize that there is a there is at some point a trade off between competition uh, and stability. Um, but I'm again I'm not convinced that that uh, the Canadian or Australian systems are the way to go. I mean the British system, which was very similar, right, completely collapsed uh, in in, in two thousand seven to nine, because I think Britain Britain wasn't selling commodities to China. Uh, they they were exposed in the way the United States was exposed. Um, so I, I, I'm not convinced that this oligopolistic structure is, 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 is beneficial. Um, you know, one, one question that people have is that the, the Australian housing market and the Canadian housing market have been incredibly hot, uh, partly because of the commodities boom, partly because they've, they've brought in a lot of immigration, particularly from China. Um, many people are worried that those systems are both exposed to potential major problems if the housing market ever cools off. I mean, we, we shall see. I guess that's a fair point. I mean, people used to point to Deutsche Bank in Germany as an example of universal bank. Yeah. Oh, terrible. I mean, it, it, it's the, it, I think Citigroup and Deutsche Bank are sort of, Deutsche Bank are sort of the poster children for the, the failures of universal banking. Um, <laughs> the last year, so you said that, that universal banks weren't able to really withstand the the pandemic and the economic crisis and, and weren't able to help stabilize markets. Is that yeah. a oh, go ahead. Sorry. one of, one of the, the the um counter arguments is that this is really an unprecedented exogenous shock to the financial system and that it, there was really no financial system that was going to survive this unscathed. And if you look at sort of who's done the best uh in the last year it's sort of the largest banks right they're the ones that have attracted the largest uh, amounts of deposits they're the ones who've been able to administer the largest volume of loans they've been financially the most healthy is the last year actually a counterexample of how universal banking might work well my view is uh if if uh, if the, if if the if the system we had, let's say the United States system, if it had shown you know any resilience at all, I'd be more sympathetic. But I mean, the Fed rushed in in a matter of days uh, after the pandemic crisis broke. It, pandemic crisis broke into the open, and in, in September 2019, the Fed had had to intervene in the repo market to stop a crisis in the repo market, and the Fed basically had to insert itself as the repo lender of last resort beginning in September 2019 and really continuing you know all the way up to the pandemic crisis and then greatly increasing its status as repo lender of last resort. So my view is that you know September 2019 showed us that there was something quite wrong in our financial crisis in our financial system in a non with without any economic crisis and in fact in the midst of an economic boom uh, the Fed had to rush in and, and unfreeze the repo market and then in March 20, they, 2020, they didn't even hesitate. They 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 immediately rushed in and did everything they did over a period in 2007 and 8. They they immediately reproduced it in a matter of days. 
And they also bailed out the corporate debt market, which they'd never done before. So to me, that showed that the, our system was incredibly unstable and the universal banks are supposed to be the bedrock of it. So now how well they performed since then? I mean, I think clearly they performed better in the sense of having more capital and more liquidity, and that's a good thing. Um, you know, obviously they're, they're certainly viewed as too big to fail. So if, if you're gonna move deposits anywhere, you're gonna move them into the big too, big, too big to fail banks. So I think that to me, their attraction of deposits is mainly a function of their too big to fail status as opposed to any inherent advantage. They certainly don't pay uh, any kind of return on deposits. Um, loans, I mean, that's kind of interesting because um, you know many people will say that the, the, the community banks did much better uh, with loans to small businesses than, than the big banks did, uh, that they actually performed considerably better uh, for smaller and medium-sized companies than the big banks did. I don't know. I mean, obviously, these arguments will continue to be made, but um, a system that needs constant backstopping, to me, is not a system that ha has long-term resilience and attraction. Um. Can you talk a little bit about the common argument that we hear in terms of shadow banking? So one common theme that you see in our field is if you heavily regulate the banking sector, including by reimposing Glass-Steagall, that's just going to shift more capital to the less regulated shadow banking market. How would you respond to that? Well, the first thing I think we have to do is, is again, to create a strong differentiation between what banks do and what what, what uh, shadow banks do. So to me, banks should be the providers of, of, of short-term deposit services, payment services, liquidity services, and they should be making you know, commercial loans. Um, the problem is, again, I believe if you took the short-term uh, deposit substitutes away from shadow banking, no more money, money market mutual funds, no more short-term repos, no more short-term commercial paper, that would force the shadow banking uh, system to shrink very significantly. They could still, you know, they could still intermediate, but they would have to fund themselves with longer term paper, in my view, at least 91 day paper and longer. The other thing is I believe that the, the, the regulators would not have to always rush in to back up the securities markets to protect the banking market. In other words, ever since uh, really 1998, when, when Glass-Steagall was pretty much gone, uh, the federal government has rushed in to back up the securities markets to prevent banks from, from being in serious trouble. If the banks were totally separated, I think that at least the, the federal government could make it much more ambiguous or questionable whether they would always rush in to, to, to uh, back up the securities market. I think that would bring in much more risk-based pricing and market discipline. Um, and I think a lot of the crazy stuff we see going on, SPACs, uh, does anyone understand what what they're doing? What 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 who who they benefit except for their insiders? Uh, I think a lot of these very speculative uh, ventures and structures would not exist. Um, would there be less finance? Yes, I believe there would be. Uh, would there be less good finance? I don't think so. I mean, I think we have a lot of, in my view, bad finance going on. Um, and uh, you know, I would like to see us move, you know, to to a, to a system that wasn't so dominated by finance. I'd also like to see us move more to an equity-based system where uh, companies were much more incentivized to uh, issue equity rather than debt. Uh, we ought to look at why debt you know, gets tax deductibility where obviously equity uh, gets no deductibility for dividends. In other words, why, why do we prefer debt over equity? I, I don't understand that. So it seems to me we can get better, get, get better and, and, and more stable and resilient finance if we change uh, the way it's structured now. So, so I understand the, the the perils of leverage and the perils of too much debt in the in the financial system, but how else is there is there some other yardstick that you're using to measure sort of good finance versus bad finance? Because SPACs are actually equity, right? So that's yeah, right, right. So th th and then that's a question really more of of, of you could say of disclosure uh, uh, and you know our. our are investors in SPACs really getting appropriate disclosure as to the risks they're taking and, and, the, and the benefits the insiders are getting? Um, so, you know, I think that, that, that uh, uh, you know, if we get, you know, 
more debt out of finance and more equity into finance. Uh, and I think it, also it, 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 if we changed this sort of uh, uh, asymmetric risk curve, which we have right now, which is everybody thinks that, that they can shoot the moon and, and there's, a, there's a stable floor because the governments and central banks will step in. I don't think you'd see the same uh, unbelievable compensation structures you see now where you know people get tens or hundreds of millions of dollars a year in compensation for essentially very speculative activities. I think finance would stop drawing as many talented people and, and talented people would be drawn to other sectors of the economy. So I, I do think that when, when, when you have a basic, uh, essentially what I view as a, a speculative system that is full of moral hazard and, and almost crony capitalism by being backstopped by the federal government and the central banks, you distort your entire economy toward a, a more finance heavy um, and, and uh, also you, you distort compensation for the same reason. Um, would we have the current shadow banking system if it wasn't for big banks? I mean, let me go 180 degrees. Yeah. Like, would we have um, repo markets and securitization and money market mutual funds, at least in their current form and current size, if it wasn't for the largest uh, banking groups uh, acting both as commercial banks and as investment banks, aren't they? Uh, I think I, 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 I believe that that uh, you know, if we if we brought in a new Glass Steagall. Essentially, we could have uh, large commercial banks still providing those services uh, because I don't. The, the repos is essentially a form of secured lending. Uh, money market mutual funds would essentially would be a different type of deposit account. Uh, I don't think those services would go away. Um, so I, 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 I would. I believe banks would would meet those requirements for uh, transactional liquidity and for short term secured uh, essentially deposit type products or secured lending type products uh, if, if there were no, you know, shadow banks. Uh, and to me, that would be, you know, the, first of all, regulators would have a much better idea about what those markets look like. I mean, the repo market, you know, the, the regulators don't actually have a very good idea about many sectors of the repo market. If you put all short-term deposits uh, and, and, and repo loans inside banks, uh, regulators could see exactly what those markets look like. Interestingly, from the point of view of monetary policy effectiveness, reserve requirements would become incredibly effective if all short-term uh, liquid claims had to be inside banks. Suddenly, uh, you know, reserve re requirements could be used very effectively to determine how much uh, liquidity uh, what kind of liquidity reserves uh, banks should hold for short-term claims, as opposed to right now, if you put higher, actually there are no reserve requirements effectively now, because if you put reserve requirements on banks, uh, liquidity just runs over to the shadow banking system uh, and escapes the reserve requirements. Uh, I think it would be really interesting to see how, how, how money market, how, how monetary policy would work if all short-term claims were within regulated banks. So you, you talked a little bit about your 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 concern, sort of the big concern in, in that keeps you up at night now is yes. tech and banking. FinTech is an incredibly broad term that means lots of different things to lots of different people. What specifically are you concerned about? Is it the OCC's FinTech charter? Is it Amazon owning a bank? Is it um uh is it people holding money in PayPal and thinking that, that their account is deposit insured. But what what is your particular so I, I go back to you know what what, are, what makes banks special. And uh, the first two things which really are functions for banks are taking deposits and 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 providing payment services. So my view is that uh, we cannot let uh, you know outside non banks you know, into that business uh, in, in ways that you know could destabilize the entire system. So you're right. Part of it is I don't I I don't like to think that that uh, uh, you know Apple Pay could could essentially become uh, a, a full competitor of the bank payment system. Uh, I think that that would, you know and, and yet Apple would not be regulated in the way that a bank is. Uh, if if Apple wants to submit to 
consolidated supervision by the Bank Holding Company Act and, and get a chartered bank and give up its commercial enterprise is fine. But um, I think it's, it's, you know, Wirecard and Greensill tell us what's likely to happen if you let unregulated people in. The second thing I would say, I, I, you brought up PayPal. PayPal is a disaster waiting to happen. I mean, they have somewhere around 40 or $50 billion of customer balances being held by PayPal, which they reinvest in securities. Uh, they're not backed up by deposit insurance. Um, what if PayPal goes under? Those people are going to say, wait a minute, you know, you know, PayPal is operating under money transmitter licenses. The feds know all about PayPal. They've allowed this to go on. It used to be PayPal would put all customer balances in FDIC insured deposit accounts at banks, and they would draw it out of the bank when the customer wanted it. Now they're just holding it mostly themselves. And I think this is a disaster waiting to happen because when, when, when PayPal or something like PayPal fails, just like when the money market funds were having a run, people are going to say, hey, this is a deposit. You made us think it was a deposit. Um, bail us out. You, know, you, you can't let this go under. So it's not just a payment system. It's a combination of offering payment services with something that functionally acts like a deposit. Is that that? I, I think that's key because I mean I don't have a problem with Western Union. Uh, Western Union, as as I understand it, is a money transmitter, and basically you have to give them uh, essentially secure funds that you have parted with. You you've parted with your ownership of those secured funds, and they transmit them to somebody else that you sent them to. Uh, so money transmitter, I think there needs to be regulation, but that doesn't threaten, I think, the idea that that now these are essentially quasi depositories uh, that are, you know, as you say, holding customer balances, providing payment services, and in different ways that I, 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 I confess I don't fully understand, in different ways they are interacting with and connecting with the existing bank payment system. So you you, you begin to have a hybrid structure that's half regulated and half unregulated. Uh, I, I think that the, again, to me, the dividing lines have to be much clearer than they are right now. Yeah, I think that's fair. With the exception of some of the, the digital or cryptocurrencies, a lot of the new payment systems are either riding on, riding on existing rails or using existing right. bank ECH transfers, or they're using uh, credit card uh, networks. So it, it's not an entirely new system at all. Right, um, right. Community banks, like, are they under a lot of threat? Are we looking at a potential major change in the banking ecosystem, given that community banks are facing competition from the giant banks, competition from fintechs? Um, should we be worried about uh, the future of smaller banks? I, I think certainly so. I mean, obviously, the smallest banks are disappearing. Uh, most of them are, are merging into larger community banks. But you're right, even the large community banks are, are faced with considerable threats because uh, th there are enormous uh, subsidies that the biggest banks have that they don't get. Uh, they have, as you say, many of the same regulatory burdens. Um, and, uh, and I think we have to have to understand that that community banks provide this unique uh, service in two ways. One is that they provide the credit to small and medium-sized enterprises that essentially the big banks don't want to serve except in a very impersonal way through business credit cards that often provide, you know, very high high cost credit. Um, and by the way, fintech providers in that space also provide very high cost credit. So the, 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 the community banks provide a relationship-based, long-term, uh, more resilient type of credit in their community, and they also often provide a very vital civic function um, in supporting the civic activities of that community. You know, it's it's not a surprise that we have a lot, historically, we've had a lot more small towns in the United States. In Canada, <laughs> there aren't so many small towns. There are big open areas where there are no small towns because there are no banks to serve them. Um, we definitely see communities dying in the vine here in the United States when they've lost their banks. I mean, I think that you know, to me, community economic development should be part of our concern. I think community banks play a huge role in that, in that function. So I don't think we should be indifferent about their disappearance. I think we should be very concerned about their indifference. We see very big inequalities now between the so-called, you know, attractive hub 
cities or hub, you know, sort of high tech centers and a lot of smaller and medium sized communities. And I think partly that's because the community banks are, are losing their opportunity or ability to support the, the, the non, you know, high, high tech hub type cities. So I, I believe that's a, that, that, that is a, a public policy concern that we ought to be paying more attention to. So I think Samuel giving us the, the sign for a time for audience Q and A. You may need to unmute yourself, Sunil. Uh, thanks very much for a, for, for a very interesting discussion. Um, um, uh, please type your uh, questions into the Q and A. Uh, for some reason, I, I have um, Amaro Gomez here, but I can't for some reason see the question that, that he's asked. So um, a, um, if, if 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 Kyle or uh, Taja can make sure that I'm, I'm I'm getting the questions on the on the, on the Q and A, but uh, thanks for um, that, that was a very nice, very wide ranging uh, discussion. Let me start by ask, I'm, I'm asking a couple of questions um, now. I mean, you spoke a lot about the structure of the financial system, how we need separation of um, banking from capital market intermediation, that we need separation of commerce um, and 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 banking. Um, let me start by asking some questions on the regulatory structure. You know, especially the regulatory structure that that we have. So, so are you saying that we need something like Twin Peaks plus a systemic risk regulator? Um, I, I think that you know we we could certainly think about simplifying the structure of, of of federal regulation. I would start by saying that one reason I want to simplify uh, the structure of banking is I think that regulators, you know, are, are not good at, to, at doing too many things. So. I think they have shown, unfortunately, that regulating financial conglomerates, they had not been very effective at that. They 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 missed, you know, big risk problems at financial conglomerates leading up to the financial crisis of 2007-09, and I'm not convinced they didn't miss risks leading up to 2020. Um, if you imagine allowing banks to combine with big technology firms and other commercial firms, how is it possible for financial regulators even if they were given consolidated supervision to carry it out, right? It, 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 they, they, they'd have to be regulating way too many things that they don't know anything about. Now, on the regulatory structure, I think you're right that we have probably, in, in, you know, too many regulators, certainly merging the CFTC and the SEC into a single, if you like, financial conduct regulator would make eminent sense for political reasons, obviously, uh, it's been impossible, but it would make eminent sense to have one financial conduct regulator. I, I think there's a lot to be said for having one prudential regulator at the federal level, uh, which could well be the FDIC. Um, and uh, I think that the Fed could obviously, as it has, provide the systemic risk uh, regulator role. Uh, and and then I think it, it, it you could have the, the, the Consumer Financial uh, Protection Bureau you know, being the consumer regulator, so maybe maybe it's four four federal regulators. Um, but I think we could certainly simplify the structure somewhat. I'm not in favor of one because the financial uh, supervisory authority in England, if that's the right, if the FSA did not perform well. I think again because it was trying to do too many things for, in too many fields and and missed the ball. Uh, so for the reasons I don't buy the universal banking argument, I don't buy the single regulator argument, but I do think we could we could certainly, you know, come down from six or seven regulators to four uh, at the federal level pretty effectively. Um, so, so a related question is, um, you know, the, in the independence of regulatory agencies, right? There, there's been much written about the independence of the central bank um, and it's been studied quite a bit. But there's, um, is there a case for greater independence for regulatory and supervisory agencies? Um, and, you know, political, budgetary, intellectual independence uh, for, for, for the regulatory agencies? Well, one, one reason I, I, I would, you know, be in favor of getting rid of the OCC is that it sits in the Treasury Department, which means that it's directly under uh, a, a, you know, a, a politically uh, sensitive and, 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 and politically accountable uh, cabinet official. And the OCC, in my view, has been one of the most political of financial agencies through most of its history. Uh, the FDIC, you know, is an independent agency uh, and is an agency really directly accountable to the public through the deposit insurance fund and very visible to the public through the deposit insurance fund has been much more independent of the industry and much more likely to, to be tough on the industry because 
the deposit insurance fund is their yardstick, is their measuring stick for determining how well they're doing. And they know that, and they're very sensitive to it. So they don't want banks to fail and, and banks to do crazy things and fail. The Fed is, has had a mixed record, you have to say. They've been independent at some points and not very independent at others. They were not independent at all, for example, during the World War II uh, in immediate post-war era. They weren't independent during the Nixon administration and the late Johnson administration. And one wonders, you know, as, as the Fed balance sheet continues to grow and grow and grow and the Fed becomes, you know, backstop to the world, you know, how independent are they now? Uh, you know, that, that uh, you know, since 2008, they've been basically working in lockstep with the Treasury to backstop the financial markets and to absorb the continual increase in government debt. I think that you know Paul Tucker has written very powerfully and persuasively on this on this topic. I think it's really questionable how uh, under an unconventional monetary policy with an ever growing balance sheet, a central bank of any kind can really continue to be independent. Um, so, so we have some questions from the audiences, and let me uh, try and um, all of them. So let's start with the first one. You haven't said, uh, uh, and this is from Gerald Epstein, he says, you haven't said anything about derivatives and the risk associated with them and how they should be regulated. What are your right. views on, 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 the, on the derivatives market? Yeah, so certainly if you, look in, if you look at my book in the final, in the concluding chapter, which is sort of what called the case for a new Glass-Steagall Act, uh, I would not allow banks to be engaged in derivatives dealing and trading uh, in, 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 in that sense. I would, I would allow them to have derivatives uh, for bona fide hedging purposes, uh, pretty much under a position to position hedging basis. I, I, for the same reason, I don't think banks should be involved in securities underwriting and dealing. Uh, I do not believe they should be involved in, in, in derivatives underwriting and dealing because derivatives are either synthetic securities or synthetic insurance when you get down to it. And I don't think banks should be involved in either business. Now, I do think they should be allowed to hedge their own risks. And so, for example, I think banks obviously are engaged in in, in federal government bond trading and uh, state government bond trading. They they should have hedges for, for those. And if they're engaged in foreign exchange trading, they can have hedges for foreign exchange. But it has to be hedging. It can't be speculative dealing, in my opinion. Again, I think that should be done in the in the in a in a separate part of the financial markets, well regulated uh, by the uh, CFTC. Um, you know, through clearing houses with appropriate margins and uh, other capital requirements. Um, the, the problem is that, you know, derivatives dealing has become another too big to fail business because it is inside the biggest banks. And I think that's a mistake. So, so then we have another question, which is related um, uh, from Andy Filado. He says, would a move away from universality affect the competitive advantage of the U.S. CIFIs? You know, this is the, the, the one of the arguments that's made is that if if if, if the, um, the banks have to um, provide services to multinationals and these multinationals are really large, we also need large banks, and then you know you sort of move towards universality. Um, now, will that affect um, the efficiency of the U.S. financial system or um, you know U.S. productivity and growth? Now, I, I would allow, uh, as again as indicated in my concluding chapter, I would allow banks to provide syndicated loans. Uh, with appropriate skin in the game requirements of holding back at least 5% so they have meaningful risk exposure. Uh, I think syndicated lending can be done in a way that, that doesn't involve uh, all the risks and, and dangers of, of securities underwriting and trading. Um, so I, I do think that, that banks could, 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 through syndicated lending, meet the largest credit needs of, of large corporations. Uh, essentially, go back to the 1980s and 90s before Glass-Steagall was gone, uh, when banks were basically competing with uh, securities broker dealers, and they were competing both domestically and abroad. And U.S. banks and U.S. securities broker dealers at that time were widely viewed as the most innovative and effective financial institutions, far better than their Japanese or European uh, competitors, partly because they were more specialized and partly because they had very active competition uh, in their home market. Uh, and, and therefore, they were innovative. Um, I, I would think that if, if Glass-Steagall came back, you would again have a, a group of uh, independent securities broker dealers, probably including Goldman and, and Morgan Stanley. Uh, I would expect them to be very effective in the corporate finance area. Uh, I would expect the, the larger banks to be effective through syndicated lending. I don't see why we can't go back to the 1980s and, and 90s when, when that system uh, 
you know, worked very well internationally. And again, if, if, if we create a more stable and resilient and less crisis prone system, uh, I think that will become obvious. And I think other countries will be uh, very strongly inclined to, to copy us, I think, starting with the UK. So I, 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 my, my own view is I don't think we should maintain a, a, an unstable crisis prone system uh, just because of, uh, you know, concerns about competitive advantage, because I, I think the record of the pre, uh, pre graham leach bliley period indicates that the competition would, would be quite effective. So there's another question, um, you know, talking about the structure of, 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 of capital markets. Um, and this is from, um, from Robert Charetta saying that we've seen the launch of a number of new exchanges to operate as clearing for equities, bonds, currencies, um, and, and even cryptocurrencies. Um, does this both complicate the system as well as complicate the regulatory response? And what is the best way to address it? Yes, uh, I, I might actually ask uh, Eric to weigh in on this one because central clearing houses uh, has, has been more in his uh, scholarly wheelhouse than mine. I, I, I do think the questioner is quite correct in saying that central clearing houses or clearing parties uh, are, are very important, but have to be carefully regulated. Uh, uh, I think that's possible, but I would ask Eric to weigh in on that one. Yeah, so I, I mean, my view is that central clearing of things like derivatives um, is vital, but uh, I think you're absolutely right, uh, Art, when you're creating uh, large uh, clearing houses, you have to worry about whether you're centralizing uh, financial risk, and you have to be very, very careful in terms of making sure that those uh, entities have effective uh, risk regulation, position limits, margin limits. Um, you, know, you also, I think, have to worry about the, the governance structure of those exchanges and uh, clearing houses. So one of the things that I think um, is a nice segue between your work and the question is that the governance of both investment banks uh, and exchanges changed pretty radically uh, in the 80s and 90s, right? From large mutually owned uh, exchanges uh, and clearing houses and large uh, uh, partnerships, partnerships yeah. towards uh, publicly owned uh, uh, IPO, uh, publicly owned uh, corporations. And that radically changes the incentives of the of the managers of those organizations uh, in terms of risk and reward. So I think looking at the governance of banks, looking at the governance of investment banks, and looking at the governance of things like exchanges and clearing houses is also very key. I'd make one more point, which is uh, I think Stephen Lovin and others have talked about this. Uh, it's not clear that Dodd Frank really sets up a good resolution regime for a failing clearinghouse. The Fed can can go in and provide lender of last resort support, but it's not clear that the uh, resolution authority of Dodd Frank uh, applies to clearinghouses. Uh, certainly, we have to establish a good mechanism by which uh, a failing clearinghouse could be effectively resolved by uh, the, the federal regulators so that you wouldn't have just a disorderly collapse or automatic bailout. So, so let me uh, um, raise another set of questions. Um, what do you think of uh, central bank digital currencies? Um, and do you think that central bank digital currencies um, uh, um, have the potential of changing uh, the structure towards what you have in mind? Or is that that the central bank digital currencies will complicate matter even more? Um, and then, you know, some has asked questions about, you know, what are your view on cryptocurrencies? But I think that um, answering it in the context of central bank digital currencies should address the issue of cryptocurrencies. I, th I think that the, the, the question about digital currencies to me indicates uh, the question about whether uh, individuals or or, or non-financial companies should be given direct accounts of the Fed, which uh, obviously that's a, that's a very active uh, argument uh, and proposal uh, by Morgan Ricks and others uh, that, that, that you would have these Fed accounts uh, for individuals and, and companies. Uh, that would certainly create a problem as to whether or not you would essentially disintermediate the entire banking industry because people wouldn't have to use bank accounts anymore. Um, and I worry about that. I, I think I, I think banks perform an important function uh, 
uh, I, I would not like to see them uh, disintermediated. Uh, I do think there's an issue issue about access. Okay, that a lot of people do not have practical access to banking accounts, uh, and you know it may be that that digital accounts uh, could could provide uh, at least some type of basic banking services to people who can't get them at banks. Perhaps uh, the proposal for digital accounts and digital currency would encourage banks to do a better job at providing basic banking services to everyone. Um, I, I do think that, that, the, that the number of people who are unbanked it should be a matter of great concern. Uh, and I, I, I would view direct central bank accounts as sort of the, of, of a last resort for solving that problem. Uh, but I do think it's a problem. Um, uh, Eric, do you want to weigh in on, on the digital uh, uh, currency issue? Yeah, I think it's it's a very, very complicated issue, and I'm not sure that just having central bank digital currencies is going to drive out other cryptocurrencies out of the market altogether. One of the, the things that attracts, I think, central bankers to digital currencies is the um, prospect of using them for unconventional monetary policy particularly at moments like we've experienced recently when uh, interest rates are close to the zero bound. Um, but that, um, I think, scares the living daylights out of a lot of people who want to use digital currencies, right? They, they want to, they're very concerned about unconventional monetary policy and they're very con concerned about um, uh, the um, uh, diminution and value of their asset. Uh, on the other hand, there's many, many people who are in cryptocurrency markets right now who are clearly not using it for payment systems at all. They're using it as a speculative asset. So for for those ki specific kinds of cryptocurrencies, like that looks more like a bubble and less like an actual payment system. There's obviously- Yeah, I, I want to add my point on uh, to my view uh, and my endorsement of Eric's point. I think the idea that cryptocurrencies could be used as a payment, as a secure and reliable payments device seems to me an absolute non-starter. I mean, how, how how can a cryptocurrency for which you don't know the value from moment to moment be a, any kind of reliable payment device? Okay, maybe as, as, as Eric said, it's a speculative asset and you could treat it as a speculative payment. You're taking a risk at what the value of the payment will be, but I don't see how speculative payments could ever meet the demands of normal uh, you know, exchanges of goods and services and normal, uh, what people normally use payments for. Uh, I'm very concerned about people who claim that they've created some kind of stable coin uh, when you don't even know what's behind the stable coin or how often what, what, what is behind it changes. So certainly I think to me, a stable coin sounds uh, dangerously like a money market mutual fund that, that presumes that it has a, a stable net asset value, but actually doesn't. And we've seen what happened with money market mutual funds at the first sign of trouble, uh, you have panicked runs. Runs. So I think stable coins uh, to me are, are the most uh, potentially dangerous because they, they they parade themselves as some kind of quasi deposit, which I, I think they're not. I'm so, so you're not a big fan of the stable coins that are being sponsored by some of the larger banks either. Right. Just guessing art. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that, you know, uh, there's the, the greater fool theory is still alive and well on Wall Street. I'm afraid. So to, I, I mean, you know, we're running out of time. So let, I, I have two two more questions to ask. One is, um, you know, you, you you can pass on this one if you want. And and this is, I think, uh, given um, given the technological advance and with the coming of fintech, there are some I think very fundamental issues that we have to deal with, which have to do with data. You know. Um, statistical capacity and data collection, granularity, um, collaboration across agencies, how we store them, where we store them. Um, these also bring in cross-border issues. Um, how do we uh, impose conditionality of access to certain kinds of data? Um, so this sort of you know raises a huge number of concerns because in some sense, um, the data foundation is central to competitiveness concerns. It, you know, education, cultural issues, all kinds of uh, things come in. And I think um, they also define in many ways um, how we can think of developing a, a digital financial system, right? So, so the data issues become very, very central to this. Um, 
how, how, how do we even start thinking in terms, in terms of um, these data issues? You know, data monopolies, antitrust issues, inclusiveness, data sovereignty among countries. This is going to be a huge set of issues, which I think are going to be relevant to um, the development of the financial sector digitally. Um, I, I would just say, I think privacy is a huge issue. I think competition and exclusion or inclusion are huge issues. And again, I would go back to China and say, there have been a lot of concerns about privacy where the big data companies like uh, Alibaba, you know, uh, and, and Ant and Tencent and WePay get all your, your personal data as well as all your financial data and how that data is then used and, and, and misused. And there also have been very great concerns about exclusion and inclusion that oh, if, if you're on, you know, uh, Ant Financial's uh, platform, you can't use uh, WePay or WeChat uh, and vice versa, that you get these exclusionary uh, uh, situations. We've already seen that obviously, you know, in the struggles here in this country between people like Google and Microsoft and Apple and, and so on. So my view is if, if you allow the data to become owners of banks, you are going to complicate all of these issues about privacy, inclusion, and exclusion and so on. Um, so again, is data going to be the servant of commerce and finance or is data going to be the master? Uh, I think that's a question that we ought to think about in the same way that do we really want financial services to be the master of everything else? I don't think we want data to be the master of everything else either. So one last question. Um, given the appointments, this is from Anne Florini, she, she asks, um, given um, uh, the appointments, um, we, 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 given the appointments we've seen to date in the Biden administration, what regulatory changes might we expect to see the administration undertake? And will those changes address some of your concerns? Uh, I don't, unfortunately, I don't see Glass-Steagall on, on, the, on the horizon right now. I hope that it might be, get on the horizon, but I, I don't see it right now. Um, the separation of banking and commerce, uh, certainly that has been a, an important concern of Senator Brown over many years, and I hope it will continue to be. I, I know Eric may have more to say on this than I do. What do you think, Eric? Uh, I mean, I think our, a lot of the ideas in your book are kind of um, uh, not on the political horizon now. Unfortunately, I think you're, you're right about that. I do think there's a great value to having a lot of thinking, though, uh, for if an another financial crisis comes along, um, having ideas ready to go off the shelf. Um, I don't think that there's going to be a lot of appetite in the near term for breaking up large financial institutions. What about the uh, separation of banking and commerce? Do you think there's this uh, concern about uh, uh, really letting the technology companies uh, start to really establish a major beachhead in the banking industry. Well, let me troll you a little bit here, Art, um, because I think one of the the benefits of the Graham Leach Bliley Act was it did have privacy provisions that are yes, I agree with that. And a lot of those privacy provisions don't apply to non banks. So um I think um looking at Graham Leach Bliley as a potential starting point for thinking about um protecting customer privacy uh in financial services might be one of the the things that you and i agree with was actually good right. because it goes along with the idea of consolidated supervision and bank holding company treatment um absolutely um, i think we've um we've, we've run out of time uh thanks you very much art for a a great presentation um a great book um and thanks very much um, eric for um pushing art to um, clarify um, certain <laughs> certain of his views and actually bringing out some of his views. Um, I think it was a very, very rich discussion and I think this is gonna continue for quite some time. Um, so with that, let me say thank you to um, um, everyone who uh, joined us and the questions that they raised. Um, and we will continue this discussion uh, in this forum um, with uh, what, and, and bring other people to discuss um, these issues. So thank you, Art. Thank you, um, Jeremy. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Eric. Um, it was a very, very nice discussion. So good day. Good afternoon. Thanks so much. To everyone.